We are going live to Facebook. Facebook is preparing itself. And we are live on Facebook. I have 70 people in the waiting room. I'm going to admit them all now. Cassidy, you'll admit people after this who join later. Okay. Hello. Welcome. We're going to wait just about a minute or so. We had uh, 70 people flood in from the waiting room. It's so wonderful uh, to see all of your faces. We do, so if you have video enabled, we can see you. We're thrilled by it. If you want to see everybody, you can also scroll over on the screen. Um, everyone is muted as you come in. And uh, we just have a couple people still in the waiting room and I will then get us started. A quick note, we are simultaneously broadcasting this on Facebook Live. If we reach our capacity of 100 people, people will have to go over to Facebook Live um, in order to see it. But it is broadcasting live on Facebook if you want to watch it in two places at once. So it's 7.03 <laughs> and I guess I will begin. Um, good evening. Thank you so much for joining Sinister Wisdom for our first ever Zoom reading. My name is Julie Enzer. I am the editor and publisher of Sinister Wisdom. And all of us here hope that you and your families and loved ones are faring well through this difficult time. I'm certainly saddened by the conditions in the world that bring us together on Zoom and make things like the first Zoom reading ever happen but I'm thrilled that we can all be here together and spend this time together. Before we begin, I want to dedicate our reading this evening to She-Wolf, our dear friend and companion. She-Wolf was also known as Dr. Jean Boudreau. She died on Thursday, April 23rd. She-Wolf published six editions of She-Wolf's Directory of Women's Land and Lesbian Communities beginning in 1993. In Sinister Wisdom, Kate Ellison describes her as making her way around the country from her home base in Louisiana to visit as many lesbian lands as possible. She also was the energy and inspiration behind Woman World in Louisiana, which in her words started out being a land dyke place where lesbians could come and live, but it turned into a workshop place where they came and learned skills and left. She Wolf was one of the first women I connected with when my wife and I moved to Florida. She had just moved to an independent living community in Sun City Center. She Wolf was funny, fierce, direct, realistic, and caring. She loved poker, and in particular, stealing my father in law's money through poker. She loved woodworking and lesbians and sex. She lived her life on her own terms. I'm sad that she is not with us any longer, and I dedicate this evening's words and readings to her. Now we'll begin our program. Sinister Wisdom is thrilled to publish the fifth installment of the Southern Lesbian Feminist Activist Herstory Project as Sinister Wisdom 116, Making Connections. I'm holding the copy here. The journey of publishing from the Herstory Project began in 2014 with Sinister Wisdom 93, Southern Lesbian Feminist Herstory from 1968 to 1994. 
It continued with Sinister Wisdom 98, Land Dykes of the South, published in the fall of 2015, and from which I quoted information about She-Wolf. Sinister Wisdom 104, Lesbianima Rising, documented lesbian feminist arts in the South between 1974 and 1996. It was published in the spring of 2017. Sinister Wisdom Hot Spots, Creating Lesbian Space in the South, published in the summer of 2018. And now we have Sinister Wisdom 116, Making Connections, a celebration of the literary and book cultures of lesbian feminists in the South. All of these issues have been written and edited by the extraordinary women involved with the Southern Lesbian Feminist Activist History Project, six of whom you'll meet in the next hour. This group, the Southern Lesbian Feminist Activist History Project, meets two times a year and regularly consults together through email, telephone, and now Zoom meetings. I have great admiration and affection for all of the women involved in the project, including Rose Norman, Rose You Can Wave, who has been a general editor of all of these issues and worked closely with me to produce the journal. Thank you, Rose, and everyone who has been involved for your tireless dedication to preserving this history for us all. A few notes before we begin, and I introduce our readers this evening. All of the issues, except for 109's in this hot spots, are still available in print and are available for sale online at sinisterwisdom.org. If you type sinisterwisdom.org backslash oral historians into your browser, and I'll throw that in the chat when we get started, um, you will see our special deal of the first three copies of the journal for just $25. For tonight, only if you order these three copies, I'll send you the current issue so that you have all of the works that are in print. That's again, sinisterwisdom.org slash oral historians. We'll put it in the chat. While we go through the reading, please keep your microphones muted to avoid distractions. Uh, Sinister Wisdom volunteer Cassidy is working Zoom uh, for me tonight. She has the amazing big headphones that make her look like Princess Leia. Um, so if you unmute yourself, she may mute you. Don't take offense. It's just a way that we can all have a good experience together. If you drop off, hop back on to the link. We are, oh, we're just at 99. So if you drop off, try to hop back on and uh, Cassidy will admit you back to the Zoom room. If you have technical issues while we're going, feel free to put them in the chat box and Cassidy will respond to you. You can either put them in the um, chat box to everyone or just directly to Cassidy. Um, and finally, if you have questions that occur to you while the readings are happening, feel free to put those in the chat box too and I'll look for them for our Q&A period after the reading. As I mentioned, we're simultaneously live streaming on Facebook. So if Facebook comrades have questions and are hearing this, they uh, are welcome to email me, julie at sinisterwisdom.org, and I'll pop into that email before the Q&A. We expect the reading's going to be about 40 minutes, and we'll take questions for 15 or 20 minutes afterwards. Our plan is to wrap up um, after 75 minutes, which if you're in the Eastern time zone will be 8.15. If you're in another time zone, you'll have to calculate that for yourself because I didn't in advance and I cannot do it on the fly. Now, on to our reading. This evening, we have six readers joining us to read from Sinister Wisdom 116, Making Connections. This issue of Sinister Wisdom details the extensive networking of lesbian booksellers, publishers, writing groups, and newsletters through engaging interviews, first-person narratives, and innovative graphic timelines. I'm sorry we can't read from the timelines because they are so incredible and compelling. The three editors for this issue are all joining us tonight. Kate Ellison from Florida. Kate, you can wave. Meryl Mushroom from Tennessee. Meryl, please wave to everyone. And Rose Norman from Alabama. Joining the three editors are Gail Reeder in Georgia, Sherry Zahn Rosenthal in North Carolina, and Marie Steinwalk from Florida as well. Each of them will be reading from the issue and their work in the issue. These six readers represent five Southern states and demonstrate how the Southern Lesbian Feminist Activist History Project works across geographies to engage the past and create new imaginaries for a lesbian feminist future. 
So without further ado, our first reader will be Kate Ellison, who will read from the introduction to the issue, Notes for a Special Issue. Hi, this is the introduction to our special issue of Sinister Wisdom, edited by Rose Norman, Merrill Harris, and me. 21st century users of social media, email, and cell phones have nothing on second and third wave lesbian feminists when it comes to social networking. This fifth volume from the Southern Lesbian Feminist Activist History Project collects stories of the ways that lesbians all over the South connected with each other for fun and activism through feminist bookstores and publishers, writing groups, newsletters, and newspapers. Gail Reader's poem sets the stage, reminding us how it was at that time period. Making connections begins with stories of the feminist booksellers who nurtured the writing groups, distributed the newsletters, and always provided community space for lesbian culture. Now a vanishing breed, feminist bookstores once numbered over 100 locations in the United States and Canada. Rose Norman's feminist bookseller story draws on interviews with 21 booksellers in the South and others knowledgeable about the feminist bookstore movement. We include separate stories about Southern bookstores no longer in business, as well as the story of the oldest surviving bookstore that still calls itself feminist, Atlantis, Karis Books and More. Only four of the 48 bookstores collected for our 20th century bookstore timeline remain in business. Karis Books and More, which recently moved to nearby Decatur, Georgia, Book Woman and Resistencia in Austin, Texas, and Bag Lady in Charlotte, North Carolina. This issue also includes stories about feminist publishing. Nancy Blood covers the Whole Woman Press in North Carolina, and Jamie Harker writes about feminist publishers in the South and their connection to the women in print movement. Our stories of lesbian feminist writing groups begin with women rights. This Southeast Lesbian Writers Conference, which has spawned writing groups around the South for 40 years and gave birth to this history project. All of the writing group stories in this issue acknowledge a debt to women rights, which in 2019 split into two new groups, Dyke Writers and Outrageous Voices, and retired the name. Meryl Mushroom writes about a group of Knoxville lesbian writers who helped push Sinister Wisdom to get started in 1976. Like feminist bookstores, printed feminist newsletters and newspapers proliferated all over the country during the last decade of the 20th century before going online or closing down. Rand Hall constructed a timeline of over 40 Southern newsletter publications from 1969 to 2011 and Sherry Zan Rosenthal worked with us to collect memories from the vibrant newsletters published in the Triangle area of North Carolina and the women who created them. Marie Steinwalk's networking poem brings us into the experience of creating and mailing a newsletter during that pre-word processing time. It is sad that so many feminist newsletters, bookstores, and publishers are gone. Now relics of a generation remembered warmly by aging lesbians who were at the forefront of lesbian feminist activism for decades. These stories are a record of amazing acts of bravery, creativity, and hard work to express and share new lesbian thought. Today's busy feminists are rooted in and informed by the work of that generation. Fortunately, a few bookstores and many writing groups continue and some lesbian feminist newsletters survive through various online options. The future of all of the, these is uncertain as we face backlash and polarizing arguments that split even so small a group as lesbian feminists. We take heart from collecting and reading these stories and from the endless ingenuity and forward thinking that inhabits the lesbian community. We hope you find our stories heartening too. If you have a story inside you, please send it our way. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Kate. Uh, next, we will hear from Gail Reeder, who will read her poem, Hide and Seek. Gail, your mic is live. Thanks. Thank you, Julie. I'm in outside of Decatur, Georgia, in, in Atlanta. But this poem was written about my early childhood in North Carolina. Hide and Seek. Cicadas vibrate at twilight to fireflies caught in mason jars. Flickering lights released in the night, seeking and sparkling. So we seek one another, each shining in our own special way. Fifth grade fire drill, close in unlit hallways, cotton dresses, bare legs almost touching, leg hairs waving with electricity and tingling in hidden places, whispering to doodle bugs in the shadows under the porch, sharing warm breaths and secrets, waiting for birds at sunrise in the wet grass, embracing beneath a, can a canopy of shooting stars. The darkness is our friend. Quilting women gather, a dinner table of fabric between them, silent in the closeness, making comfort while comforting. We would have joined them, but we are not welcome here. Their needles flash in the light. The South has not been kind to us. We have nudged politely for our place, for we were raised with manners saying, yes, ma'am, and thank you, and, and kindness, a bless her heart to the special ones less able. These values came into the struggle with us, for where do we go when our churches and families turn us away? We flee to baseball for hidden fun under the bleachers, to political campaigns desperate for change. We meet in writers' circles, witches' circles, feminist circles. We are a well-rounded group of refugees. Potluck suppers recall family reunions under the pecan trees. We recreate the familial closeness with our own clubs and gatherings. In celebration, we share the love that is ours and hope for a brighter future where darkness is no longer a necessity. Thank you so much, Gail. Uh, now we welcome Rose Norman. Uh, one of the editors of this collection and also a general editor in the series. She will read a selection from her piece, You Had to Be Passionate and Crazy, Feminist Booksellers in the South. Be passionate and crazy? That's a quotation from Cookie Tear, who owns Southern Sisters in Durham, North Carolina. Here's another one. The day I opened Blue Stocking Books was the day I became an activist. That's Teresa Williams, who tells her bookseller story in South Carolina in this issue. For Teresa Williams, as for most second wave feminist booksellers, bookstores were a crucial part of building feminist community and networking and had been important sites of lesbian feminist activism since the first stores began opening all over the country in the 1970s. Tonight, I'm reading excerpts from some of their stories that I've collected from 21 feminist booksellers in the South. This issue also has whole stories about Ruby Fruit Books in Tallahassee, Sister Space and Books in Washington, D.C., and Karis Books and More in Atlanta, now Decatur. In the last decades of the 20th century, almost 50 feminist bookstores came and went in Southern states mostly through the diligent efforts of lesbian feminists, often at considerable personal sacrifice and always with passion and commitment to feminist values. Lamas Women's Books and More in Washington, D.C., one of the earliest and longest lasting feminist bookstores in the country, 
was in many ways typical of these booksellers' combination of activism and cultural work. Longtime store manager Deb Morris describes her Lama's experience. I can't tell you how many calls I fielded for referring st services for women in distress, either directly or through concerned friends or family. It was a meeting place for women in the community and for women coming into, a into town for a few days or for a march. Womankind Books in Nashville, Tennessee is another example of activism nourished by a feminist bookstore. The store formed the Womankind Support Group, an umbrella for a Vanderbilt Health Group, a group of people who lived in the country and didn't have access to books, take back the night marches and more. Owner Carol Powell partnered with Olivia Records to organize the first national conference of women's record label distributors in the 1970s in Nashville, the Bible Belt. In Gainesville, Florida, it was a feminist organization that spawned a bookstore. Women Unlimited had under one roof, Woman Books, the first feminist bookstore in Gainesville, Woman News, a radical feminist monthly newsletter, and the Women's Center. When the bookstore closed, Jerry Green and Carol Alban bought the stock and started Amelia's Books. Later, there was Wild Iris, which lasted until under several owners until 2017. When it closed, it was Florida's last feminist bookstore. Faye Williams was working as a marketer for a friend's consignment store in Washington, D.C., when she became aware that some customers were dealing with domestic violence and mental health issues. Williams opened what may have been the first black feminist bookstore in the country, Sister Space and Books. As the name indicates, Sister Space was always a place for nurturing black women's community, as well as a bookstore. Like Faye Williams, Audrey May conceived of her store, Mary Stem Books and More for Women and Their Friends, as more than a bookstore. Mary Stem is a botanical term for the type of plant cells that carry a plant's identity. So a snapdragon knows it's a snapdragon, a tomato remembers it's a tomato. They chose the name to convey a sense of carrying on from generation to generation and knowing who we are. Lodestar Books was that space for lesbian and feminists in Birmingham, Alabama. Owner Beth Gunderson writes, feminist bookstores are pretty magical places. They hold a place for so many different groups and people. We serve the metaphysical community, the gay and lesbian community, the recovery community, the Jungian community. So many people from so many different walks of life walk through the door and they would run into each other and cross over. People would be exposed to things. Teresa Terry Berry and her then partner, Joan Mayfield, started the first feminist bookstore in Virginia, Labyrinth Books, in the living room of their Richmond home. After Labyrinth closed, Beth Marshak and others opened women's books in Richmond. Edie Daly and her then partner, Doreen Brand, opened the well of happiness when they moved from New York to St. Petersburg, Florida, where Daly had grown up. We wanted to find the lesbians, Daly writes, so we had this idea that we would open a women's bookstore and the lesbians would find us. And within three months, we knew 150 lesbians. After so many years of feminist bookstores closing, it is refreshing that we are now seeing new ones. In Birmingham, Alabama, Katie Willis and Megan Lyle have started the Burdock Bookstore Collective, a pop-up feminist bookstore. In Durham, North Carolina, Alexis Pauline Gums and her life partner have started the Black Feminist Bookmobile, creating pop-up reading rooms in parks and other spaces. Florida is no longer without a feminist bookstore since Al Alsace Wallentine opened Tombola Books in St. Petersburg just this past December. And Jamie Harker opened Violet Valley Books in Water Valley near Oxford, Mississippi. Harker runs the Women's Studies program at nearby Ole Miss. She is an example of today's young feminists who seem to have the same brilliance and optimism that inspired that earlier wave of feminist book sellers to empower and transform women's lives through books. Thank you so much, Rose. 
Joining us next um, is Meryl Mushroom. She's reading from her piece, Knoxville Writers and the Beginning of Sinister Wisdom. Meryl, you're unmuted. Thanks, Julie. Okay, Knoxville lesbians were getting organized. After our 1974 lesbian prom, we had those typical lesbian meetings where we took on projects and formed several different interest and action groups. Along with the usual social and political activism, some of us who loved words, books, and reading and writing decided to meet as a writer's group. We thought we would be <clears throat> motivated to write more, maybe even to read our words aloud to each other if we met on a schedule as a group with assignments, <clears throat> knowing we would have support and encouragement from one another. Our lesbianly trust was such that we knew we could write honestly from our hearts or our imaginations without fear of being judged or criticized. And as radical feminist dykes, we could feel free to write and share with each other material that probably would not be acceptable to the heteronormative masses. Meanwhile, I had started long distance dating with Anne from North Carolina. One day, Anne, who knew about her writer's group said, I have these two friends at the University in Charlotte, Catherine and Harriet. They're radical lesbian separatists. They're thinking about starting a literary political magazine that will publish the kind of radical material we don't see anywhere else. They want the focus to be on what they call lesbian consciousness. They were wondering if lesbians would support this type of publication. Do you think the women in your writers group would be interested? Probably, I replied. That sounds like what we write and read. I'll ask. I would for sure. A few days later, Anne called me from North Carolina. What do you think about if Catherine and Harriet come to Knoxville with me and talk about the publication with folks from your writers group? I think that's a great idea, I replied. We can put out a word to the rest of the Dyke community, too. You get back to me about when, and I'll get hold of the lesbians. We'll have a potluck, of course, and we all can talk. And that was exactly what we did. About a dozen excited Knoxville Dykes showed up with delicious food. Catherine and Harriet told us their idea was to publish a literary journal containing material that would be considered revolutionary, that would be female empowering and give voice to that power, that would be a source of energy to counter the oppression of heteropatriarchy. They talked about sinister wisdom, sinister meaning from the left or from the other side, the side away from heteropatriarchal values and behavior. The writing in this magazine would both express and encourage acts of resistance by creating our own feminist systems, practices, and approaches to living. We certainly were interested. We were ready to order our subscriptions that very evening. We wanted to support such a publication in any way we could. Catherine and Harriet said they would need material for a first issue and invited us to send them our writing. They went back to North Carolina and did their work and got it going. And in the summer of 1976, lesbians held the first issue of Sinister Wisdom in our grateful hands. A chapter from the sci-fi novel I was writing was included in that first issue and also a story by Anne's seven-year-old daughter, Chris. The following year, I left Knoxville and moved to Bland in the Middle Tennessee Hills. And by the end of the decade, I found my home as a lesbian writer at Woman Rights, the Southeast Lesbian Writers Conference. Both Sinister Wisdom and Woman Rights have been alive and kicking now for more than four decades, feeding lesbian consciousness and enriching our lives with words. 
Thank you so much, Meryl. And no, Meryl, you're getting lots of love in the comments as well. You may not know how to oh. access the comments, but as usual, whenever, and I'll just say, take the uh, moderator's privilege and say, whenever I send out an email newsletter that includes the name Meryl Mushroom, inevitably, I hear back from a woman who says, oh, I knew Meryl many years ago. She was oh. so transformative and important in my life. I can only imagine how could I please email her. And I always try to make, make these connections. So you're getting more love in the comments, Meryl. Uh, next, we have Sherry Zahn Rosenthal, who is reading from her piece in the issue, Triangle Area Newsletter Memories. And Sherry, I've unmuted you. Thank you. All right. Well, hi, y'all. Here in Durham, North Carolina, uh, it's getting, it's very overcast, but it's getting a little darkish. So I feel like I'm going to be reading you a lesbian bedtime story here. Uh, once upon a time, in 1981, women who'd worked on the feminist newsletter, which became Feminary, and refer to the issue for a whole article about feminary. Uh, we're joined by new coordinators, including myself, as well as a cohort of friends to publish the newsletter. And for a long time, the masthead, because we could not agree on a name, the masthead just said, a publication in search of a name. So uh, I'm going to start off with Donna Giles, uh, her remembrance. It's remarkable and something to be proud of that our community in the Research Triangle produced a women's newsletter. It was an important way of communicating news and events, and it definitely contributed to our growing feeling of actually becoming a lesbian community, of being part of something and being proud of who we were. Sherry Kinlaw. We met in each other's homes and in offices where we worked. Can you imagine a bunch of young women sitting in a circle in someone's living room or kitchen to discuss patriarchy, gender bias, and issues of great concern for women and lesbians. The friends I made while working on the newsletter formed my new family, a special secret club. I was marshal at the first Pride March in Durham back in 1981, one of the marshals. One of the women marching with us was caught in a photo that made its way into the newspaper she lost her job. Everything we did was undercover and out of sight. We saw ourselves as radical feminists, and I still do. And I want to say a little something about that. All over the South, and I'm sure all over the country, women didn't really have the resources to put out these publications. And so when we gathered in offices after hours, we kind of made our employers into unwitting benefactors of radical lesbian feminism. Uh, we used to call Duke University Mr. Dukes, and Mr. Dukes sure, certainly made many contributions to the newsletter. This is from myself, Sherry Zan Rosenthal. As a young lesbian in my early 20s, TALF, particularly its programs, was crucial in helping create my framework for understanding the world. Some of the same women who are mainstays of Triangle Area Lesbian Feminists, also called TALF, were also part of Feminary, particularly before it became a literary magazine. The group of librarians that I felt were crucial to the pulling together of the newsletter included Nancy Blood, Joanne Abel, Linda Brogan, and her partner Janet Pullman. Other founder, founding coordinators were myself and Cynthia Kulstad and possibly others. I want to just give two snaps up right now for nurses and librarians who have been so important to our movement. The newsletter began after a man perceived to be gay was beaten to death at a popular swimming hole on the Eno River. That June, 1981, we had our first gay march. So much was happening so quickly that we didn't feel that once a, a once a month calendar would be adequate. So right from the get-go, we published a full issue once a month and then a sheet, an additional calendar at mid-month. Because this was before the internet and email, to get the word out about events, we relied on phone trees, mailings, street flyers, on telephone poles and bulletin boards. And so right from the start, we had that mid-month calendar. Cynthia Kulstad. The first issue of the newsletter 
produced by eight volunteers and five friends, announced, we begin what we hope will become a vital and ongoing vehicle for communication among lesbians and feminist women. We hope that this newsletter will be a participatory one. We want every woman to feel free to express what she feels is true. Deluxe. We had heated debates when a new member joined who, wasn't study, who was studying computer engineering and suggested we start keeping up with our subscriptions and mailing labels online. At the time, few people had access to computers, especially few women. So many were concerned that publishing the newsletter would become less accessible to any lesbian who wanted to work on it and was controlled by people with computers. We had no idea that in a very few years or months after those discussions, computers would become such a part of the way we communicate. So I want to hark back now as I begin to close to the beginning of the newsletter in which we had a very similar discussion, but this time it was focused on whether we would have columns. In other words, um, there were women who felt like they wanted the line to go directly across the entire page, an eight and a half and 11 by sheet. And some of us, including me, who said, no, that's hard to read. Let's have two columns. But the fear was that just having two columns would be rather technical and might take women who didn't have skills, particularly working class women, and be a barrier. And so this concern, uh, there were many working class women who participated in the newsletter and who were proud to be part of it and to gain skills in writing, layout, and editing. And this accessibility and welcome of women at all skill levels and a conscious effort to minimize barriers to entry, that class consciousness was inherent to our feminism and inherent to our practical way of going about the newsletter. So in closing, I want to say that in these times, when we really see the impact, the life or death impact uh, of who works where, who gets paid what, who is right on the edge, that class consciousness is coming to the fore for all of us. And those of us who have lived through those times are here and able to make sense of it. And I hope that we'll be active on Facebook in talking about the meaning of class and the meaning of activism. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Sherry. Um, I just want to remind folks, chat is now open. Um, it, we will take the, uh, some initial questions from chat if people have questions for our readers. And um, Meryl, we continue to see commentary about how wonderful you are that's also slightly sexually imbued. So you continue to hold that place in our hearts. Um, now we have our final reader. So do th throw some questions in the chat. Um, and now we welcome Marie Steinwachs. And she is going to read her poem as the final part of our reading. The poem is titled, Networking. And you're unmuted now. Thank you very much. It's easier to read that way. Um, this came out of a woman right workshop um, that Meryl Mushroom uh, led a couple of years ago. And it sort of evolved into this poem um, based on some of my experience. Our tenuous liberties again under siege were never surrendered without a fight. We won the right to be ourselves, brandishing peaceful weapons of communications, consciousness raising, community building. First, to overcome anonymity, names and addresses were collected like autumn leaves, pressed into mailing lists, extending a worldwide web on paper. The newsletter was our invitation to act, connect, link with kindred spirits. Each issue gathered a small squad of writers, typists, and graphic artists, prone to turn any tedious task into a potluck, often a dash of drama, romance, misunderstandings, power struggles, they seasoned the meetings, but we stayed committed to our causes of equality, justice, the right to choose. 
The printed word was the vanguard of our movement. Copies passed around, left in public places, saved. We wanted each issue to be a finely crafted call to join us, to participate. Paper was our medium, filled with square snippets of content in the smallest readable font, trimmed and fixed with wax to fit, like a jigsaw puzzle into every white space. Announcements and ads marched the margins close to the edges to leave one open window for a mailing label. Foot soldiers with ink-stained fingers and bent backs worked machines for hours, copying one side at a time, keeping the hopper full of paper, and clearing the unavoidable jams. Collating, stapling, and folding were done in a circle, often on the floor. Someone found the perfect fold line between the rows of text, and we all followed her lead for neatly aligned edges. The unchallenging but crucial task of taping the packet closed as a caution against unsympathetic eyes allowed minds to dream while hands sealed our secret lives. We stuck on mailing labels, sorted and bundled by zip code, carefully adhering to post office standards to earn the affordable bulk mail rate. A fat, bulging bundle of newsletters to one zip code testified to hotspots of support, or a bundle of single zip codes to those isolated addresses who never met but connected through the monthly mailing. Today, few newsletters arrive on printed pages. Most are crafted and read with no words touching paper. They scatter through ethereal electronic pathways and vie for attention among all the distractions. But the glowing embers of the network we fanned can now flare into an exploding nebula, a community of 10 million women around the world now mobilized by one inspired post. Thank you, Marie. It's so lovely to see all the clapping and imagine when we're all back in large rooms together what that will sound like. Um, I So there's a couple things in the chat that I just want to highlight and bring out. Um, one, lots of people who know one another and are saying hi to each other. Um, so that's lovely. And again, you can scroll through Zoom. My, my scroll bars are on the left and right. Sometimes they're on the top and bottom. Um, so you can scroll through and see the other people in the room if you like to do that kind of thing. Um, M. Siegerberg uh, asked in the chat, is anyone here from Off Our Backs? Um, so I just want to put that out there. You could private message M. Siegerberg, and I apologize, M. I do not know your first name. Um, you can chat uh, with M directly. You could also put in for everybody to know if you were associated with Off Our Backs. Maybe there are more periodical love connections to be made within this very Zoom room. And that would be Marsha Siegerberg. Marsha, thank you very much. Looking right at you on the screen. And she's toasting us with a beverage. So I appreciate that. Um, I have a question for our panelists. And also, there are other folks I know in the room who are involved in the Southern Lesbian Feminist Activist Herstory Project. Um, I know you guys have gathered a lot of stories together. We've published a lot of stories. There are um, all of your original work papers and everything are being archived at Duke University. But if somebody's in the room or and wants to get involved and have their story told, or if people know somebody whose story you maybe haven't gotten and they want to have their story told, how can people get in on this action? So Rose, I'm going to unmute you. And then I have another question uh, that's coming in as well. Go ahead, Rose. Uh, you can contact us directly and we'll follow up. And just today, anticipating that question, I created an email address for our project. <laughs> we don't even have a website. We just meet. But uh, the, the, the email address is in the comments um, or in the chat. It's 
SLFA History Project at gmail.com. And I'll check that email and follow up. Excellent. Would you repeat the email again and I'll type it into the chat box? Oh, I already did. Oh, um, you did. yeah. It's, oh, look at that. You're, you're more technical than I am. Thank you, Rose. Um, so that was our first question. Now, um, someone chimes in. Many thanks to Rose for her tireless work in gathering Southern lesbian history. Um, and I have another question um, that came in through the chat. How do you all avoid activist burnout? How do you make a lifelong commitment to lesbian feminist liberation sustainable? Who, if you raise your hand, if you want to respond, I'll unmute you. Uh, I have Sherry and then we'll have Gail. You're both unmuted right now. Sherry, go ahead. Well, for me, um, it's partially motivated by love and partially motivated by anger. So when I get pissed off about something, it's my impulse to want to do something about it. And then when other women gather with me, that's the love part. It just feels so good to gather together and do something. The Lesbian Avengers was very much like that. Some of us would get hacked off and then, you know, we put together something kind of witty and really fun and egg each other on and go do an action over at Jesse Helms' office or, you know, whatever. Um, more recently, I've been doing lesbian feminist house concerts. And when women show up, that's fabulous. And, uh, but so often women did not show up. So right now I've suspended that. So that's what makes the difference for me is it gets sustained when women show up. Showing up, great. Thank you, Sherry. I'm gonna mute you and now Gail. Well, my, my activism did not begin with lesbian or gay activism. I began with the civil rights movement back in 1962. And then we got mad about the Vietnam War. And then we got mad how women were being treated. And then we got mad how gay people were being treated. And so each, each item spurred us to new activism because the freedoms that we sought were important to our life. So uh, now we're getting to a point where we can't hardly make it to marches, but we find other ways like this to um, activate our causes, to network with one another, to find old friends who struggled with us in the past and carry that struggle into the future. And frankly, with the governor that we've got going on here in Georgia, it's easy to organize when you have someone like Governor Kemp making stupid, <laughs> stupid uh, rationalizations for opening the state and opening up our nursing homes to more disease. So I think that my activism is fed by the women around me who march with me. And we've always reinforced one another's beliefs and that belief system has carried us a very long way in the last 50 years. Thanks, Gail. Um, Meryl, I'll unmute you if you want to get in on this action. And But before Meryl does, I'll also say that I scrolled through, and I know that there are a lot of people who've done a lot of activism and sustained themselves. So if you want to chime in after Meryl, because I'm going to put her on the spot here, Unmute yourself and, and we'll take a few other comments on this question of sustainability. Meryl? I have on the spot, that must mean I'm a little ducky. Um, I've been doing activism, I guess, forever. And I love being with lesbians. And I, the more lesbians I'm with, the more of the time, the less I feel like I'm going to be burned out. And if I feel like I'm going to start getting burned out, I go outside and grow my garden. I have a garden and I recommend gardens for anybody that needs to de-stress in any way. 
Am I done? So, so gardening, excellent. Thank you. I'm just having a couple things in the chat here. First, Sheena, want, just want to raise this up. Sheena is uh, says hello from Vancouver Island and wonder if there are other Canadians here. Um, so if there are other Canadians. Oh, is, is that Sheena, are you raising your hand? No, someone else is raising their hand. The good news, Sheena, is there are other Canadians here and um, you all can put in the chat and maybe do a little connection because we like the love connections. And Meryl, you're raising your hand, you're Canadian? Oh, no, I was waving at Yami. Um, oh. But my, my sister is Canadian. She, uh, and my niece also, my niece is an urban beekeeper. Um, she lives in Guelph. Oh, and wow. My sister, my sister lives in Stratford. So maybe I'm a kind of so you Canadian. so you have some Canadian relatives. Yes, you're Canadian adjacent. Yes, excellent. All right. Um, now S Judith tells me that people there is a hand raising functionality, which I don't see. Um, but if it's there and you raise your hand, I'll see. If, like there's like a button you could press. Maybe I'll see it and then I can call on you, or you can unmute yourself and speak over me, um, which my students do all the time, so you certainly can do that as well. Let's see, we do have JJ from um, Kootenays, British Columbia. Not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. Julie, this is Judith. Uh, there's a, at the bottom, you can see there's a, um, a little icon that says participants, or it's at the bottom of my screen. I'm on a computer. Yeah. If you click on that, you'll find, you can find your name and but uh, your name will be at the top your own name and others will be alphabetized and at the bottom there'll be a place that says raise hand so that's a way for the the um uh the leader to see who is raising their hand that's another way to know who wants to talk excellent so i now see the hand raises i'm going to call on people and unmute you um, this means that speakers, you also, if you want to answer questions, should unmute yourselves as well. Uh, but first of all, we do the next question, and then I'll call on people, is what advice do you all have for 21st century uh, lesbian writers, activists, historians, feminists? So what advice do you have for this new century? Rose, I'm unmuting you to give advice. And then I've got, I've got hands up. So make your advice pithy and meaningful. So we'll go on to our other hands. I'm not, I'm not getting any, I'm not getting any advice thoughts on the 21st century. Stay healthy. <laughs> Stay healthy. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll mute you, Rose. We'll come back to that. Um, I, it looks like we have some responses in the um, chat box, which I'll get to. But Eileen, I've, you're unmuted. Eileen, what's your question? Oh, I didn't have a question. I just did the raise the hand, so maybe you would see where it was. But I want to send my love to Meryl and everyone. And um, Hope everybody's doing good in this crazy times. Love ya. All right, thank you. Um, Barbara, you're, you had your hand raised and you are now unmuted. Yes, hi, from New York City in the epicenter okay. and my tiny studio apartment. <laughs> um, I just want to add, I'm a playwright and um, one of my sisters has been a global human rights activist forever. And many years ago, I, I said to her, I wish I could do what you do. You get upset and angry and you get more political prisoners released. I just see the information and I get upset and angry. And she said, why don't you do what you do? Why should you do what I do? And that changed the whole trajectory toward uh, in my playwriting life and since then I've been writing plays about injustice about lesbians who have been forgotten or whose lives have been distorted in history and I thought it was wonderful advice from the role model that was my younger sister and um and I think sometimes there's so much pressure to do what we think we should be doing rather than what we can do best 
to be an activist. And um, just wanted to share that. Um, and thanks to my sister Phyllis for that wonderful advice. That's great. Thank you so much, Barbara. Um, we do have a great, I have a great comment from Carol. Uh, so two, two great comments that I want to highlight out of the chat. First, um, Jody Judike is here from Vancouver, British Columbia. She says, so great to be able to connect with dykes from all over. My heart goes out to all you lesbians in the USA. Thank you. Um, Jody, I'm going to flash through because I want to lock eyes on you. I've never seen you. We've only corresponded. So I'm very excited about that. So don't go away while I'm reading through this. Um, Carol, Carol, um, and I'm not sure which Carol this is, perhaps the Carol that I admire so much in the world, says, avoid burnout, question mark. We didn't. It's like swimming. You dive in, you get wet, you have a wonderful time, you get cold, you climb out for a while, get warm and dry, then dive in again and again and again. Imagine and do it. And then Jody said, love your answer, Carol. Yes, just keep going as much as we can and retreat when we need to. Um, so now I have, uh, next up in the queue, Kate, queue, Kate Allison had raised her hand. Kate, you're unmuted, go ahead. Hi, I, I just wanted to say that um, I'm excited to hear what the women who come after us are doing and that it's just so crucial that, uh, that they step up. Um, because we have um, we have gotten kind of burnt out and slowed down, and it is really, really time to pass the torch. and And I don't know what their what their ideas are and what they're going to be doing, but I'm really looking forward to hearing from uh, all the generations that came after me. That's great. Thank you, Kate. Um, Nat, so I'll read one comment here. Uh, just Tracy McMath says, for our Southern Lesbian Feminist History Project, if you'd like a website at some point, Tracy McMath would be happy to do it. So write down her name to follow up with her. Um, next in the queue, Judith Mazur, a uh, question. Yes, I would say that, I, I, would, I would say, to avoid burnout, get together with others. Make coalition, make connection, work together, and uh, take your voices and bring them out from your writing places into the world. Uh, I'll just point to Mother Tongue Readers Theater, which was organized in 1976, and we're, st we're still going. We're very, we're moribund, okay? We're, at, we're sort of maybe at the end of our trajectory, but we're still going, and we meet, we write together, and we have a, a long history, not in publication, but in, in verbal activism to be proud of. I'll say to younger women, this is something to do. It will take you out of your isolation and give you a sense of uh, working together to make something happen. It's not like marching in the street, but what it is is very, personal connection with others and uh, not only in the writing and the organizing of the performance, but in performing in the world. So I recommend that as a way to help with burnout. Thank you, Judith. Um, I have Edie Daly on, on, uh, as the next person I'm going to unmute, but I have a question here that's a longish one from the comments that I'll post. Is the on-site college women's conference obsolete? I was introduced to many lesbian presses in the 70s and 80s by browsing press tables, attending workshops. I live in Northampton, Massachusetts, Smith College, and as large as the lesbian community is, students and residents like me, we elders don't get much response when we float a college-hosted women's conference need. Is it all about social media from here on in? And I'm gonna let that question be out there and unmute Edie Daly and let um, Edie speak. Edie, I'm trying to unmute you. Are you trying to unmute yourself at the same time? Okay, am I? There, there okay. you go. So I think um, all the things that have been said about being um, with burnout, 
and are really important. And I think that one of the things that we're seeing at this particular time is how important Judith was talking about the connections. The connections of writing together, of reading together, of doing these kinds of things. We are seeing how much we miss our connections. And this, the fact that there were a hundred and some odd women on this site proves that point. And um, for me, I see that the activism change has changed a great deal and that we haven't been able to, we, d we no longer are in the streets, but there are some people who do these, you know, like, like um, the former speaker talked about um, when we were doing the actions with um, lesbian Avengers and how important it was to make it fun. And that the fun part of it um, sparks people's imagination. And it also, there's something about that humor that that's incorporated into that that just keeps us together and keeps us going great thank you edie um i have another question from the comments and then i have sonia fernetta as the next person i'll unmute the um comments uh from sheena it's great to see Sid. Great to see several young women here and wondering if any of them are willing to say a few things about how they're finding lesbian feminist community. Um, and then we have some comments from younger women that are flowing into the um, chat box. Uh, I'll, I'll highlight them after uh, Sonia, who's now unmuted, asks her question. Sonia, go ahead. Hi, it's, it's a comment actually, it's not a question, but Hi everyone, and hi Julie, this is really great to be here and see everyone. I just wanna, I, I love what you said, Barbara, by the way, is do, do what you love doing. That is going to be a, a great contribution right there. And the other thing I just wanna say is this, this to go on with what Edie was saying, I love this, part about making connections and what other people have been saying. But I would add, deepen the connections. Deepen the connections is going to be the way to, you know, in this next period, it, there is going to be more social media. You know, this is what's actually happening. We're being transformed right now. But how do we make those connections deeper, stronger? You know, and I think that's that may be something that our younger people will bring to us. It would be great. Great. I'm going to read um, a little bit from two two people who put in the chat, um, and then I think we'll wrap up. I'll, we'll do our like final little announcements kind of bit. Um, but if anybody wants to raise their hand quickly while I'm re reading these comments from the chat, this is your time. Sheena writes, younger women finding lesbian feminist community. I just turned 24, so I'm the, on the younger end. I feel I am so lucky to be a part of a Boston-based lesbian feminist consciousness raising group. And I've met tons of great friends through that. That's the group that told me about the Ohio Lesbian Festival and Old Lesbians Organizing for Change and other organizations like that. I read a lot, including the stack of Sinister Wisdom issues I got from a neighborhood thrift store a few months ago. Yay! Um, and I always research authors I like to see what they're doing now. As an archivist and oral historian, I have so much respect for my community elders. Um, and Julia Beck has her um, microphone on. So Julia, you can make a little uh, a comment before we go into my final notes. Go ahead, Julia. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, fantastic. I just wanna say, first of all, uh, okay, let me see if I can turn my, 
I don't know if you can see me. Okay, my, my, uh, my camera's off. But I just want to say thank you so, so much for having this event. I've never attended something like this before with so many women, almost 100. Uh, this is fantastic. And it's so great to hear from my elders. Thank you for all of the work that you've been doing for your whole lives. It's incredible. And uh, it's very inspiring to hear your stories. I just did, I, I did want to say something about younger lesbian community, younger lesbian feminist community. I'm 27, so I'm a young adult. And I've noticed from my own experience and from the experiences of other young women who I work with and, and who are all around the world, we are, um, you could say criminalized for calling ourselves lesbians, for having a female exclusive sexuality. And then on top of that, we are prevented from organizing or meeting or speaking or sharing ideas that are specific to women's experiences. So I put something in the chat. I suggest you all read it if you can, but I'll touch on something very quickly. It is somewhat difficult for younger lesbians to find each other because first of all, it's suddenly wrong to be a lesbian. And a lot of women are pressured to um, not call themselves lesbians, to call themselves um, transgender or trans men or to reject womanhood completely. And it's, it's very popular these days. I'm not sure if you all are familiar with this or not, but it's a huge movement. And a lot of young dykes are being, well, they're not calling themselves dykes anymore. So um, it's, it's a, Yes, it's a very, very incredibly powerful movement, and this is one of the obstacles to organizing as young lesbians that I have actually experienced in, in my life. I marched in the Baltimore Pride Parade two years ago with a sign that said, dykes don't like dick. That's not uh, wrong. I think a lot of us would support something like that, some statement like that, of course. But I was then kicked off of a government commission because my politics excludes males who call themselves lesbians. Right. It's very, very Orwellian. So I just wanted to say that um, it is so nice. As, uh, as Judith said, it helps alleviate isolation to find other women, other lesbians, other feminists, and work together. Uh, but we are under a, a, something very incredible right now. Um, and I, I hope younger women can find some bravery. Great, thank you, Julia. So thank you to everybody um, who came. This was our trial. We had a full house all night and then about another between 18 and 25 people watching us on Facebook. So this was really wonderful. It was lovely to see your faces. I wanna thank all of our readers and everyone involved in the Southern Lesbian Feminist Activist History Project. This is a great group of women doing amazing work and I've, uh, it's a privilege to be traveling with them on this with Sinister Wisdom. Thank you to all of you who joined this evening. Um, this is our first experiment with Zoom. Seems like maybe we should try it again. I do welcome your feedback. You can email me, julie at sinisterwisdom.org, or send me feedback through Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. I don't manage all of those feeds, but uh, feedback eventually gets to me through them all. Remember to order the Oral Historians Collection at sinisterwisdom.org backslash oral historians, H-E-R-S-T-O-R-I-A-N-S, -E all one word. If you order by five o'clock tomorrow afternoon, that's Wednesday, we'll send you all four of the issues in print. If you're not currently a subscriber to Sinister Wisdom, please do subscribe online, sinisterwisdom.org backslash subscribe. It's um, subscribers and donors that make Sinister Wisdom possible. We're an all volunteer um, group working on this and we need your support. So thank you all for coming out this evening. I'm gonna leave things open for a minute or two for people who wanna scroll through and see all of your beautiful faces. Um, and after about a minute or two, I'm gonna hit leave meeting and go have a little dinner. I thank you all very much for joining us. Thanks everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Julie. You did a great job. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
really wonderful. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> Zoom group. Chat. We are definitely, we are definitely a great definitely group of women, aren't we? Group of women. Good to see all you guys. to see y'all. Singing, keep dancing, keep together. Keep dancing, keep together. Okay. Hey. Hey. Caroline. Hey. Edie, Edie, Edie. There's Steve. There's Steve. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, great. Thank you. Thanks to everyone. From we don't want to leave. <laughs> we don't want to leave. We don't want to leave the room. Oh, I see Jody too. Jody, hello. Hi, Rosa. I don't want to leave, and I don't want to click the leave meeting, which will kick you all off. Right. <laughs> So I guess we should do this again, huh? Yes, 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 yes. yes. <laughs> again, again, again. And look, the loudest person about doing it again is Meryl, who hates yeah. Yes, her. yes, again. <laughs> See you next time. See you all next time. We will definitely do it again. Thanks, Julie. Thanks, thanks. All right, thank you. We're going to end the meeting now. Thank you. And June 16th at Thank Paris you. is another Thank meeting. You. If you're on the email list, you'll get more information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Julie. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.